Ben, I think. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, fair bit of news to get through this week, as in contrast to last week. So um, there's a few stories that I will have a look at, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Rich, my colleague Richard Williams, who's going to look at some property mergers. And then our guest this week is uh, Richard Sen, who's the uh, manager of Pantheon Infrastructure, which is a relatively new fund that we're all keen to know a bit more about. So um, without further ado, these are the things that I picked out. So JLEN announced that its NEV is going to jump. We don't know how much by, but they said between 13 and 15 percent. We've got a couple of um, renewable funds that we followed raising money. As I said before, we've got some property mergers too that we're just going to discuss. Um, here's the JLEN chart. And you can see that um, after a dip where long-term power price forecasts were coming down, we've now got the NEV rebuilding. And we have seen a recovery in the share price. And then you see that spike here at the end that was in response to the announcement that we're going to be talking about so that's um put it onto a premium of about um just shy of 20 percent but actually what we think is um the nev does go up um by about 14 percent the nev will be up here actually that discounts can, the premium is going to look actually much smaller than normal so we, we could have further to go um, but much would depend on what's been driving that NAV uplift. That's what the discussion has been about. So if we go back to the end of December 21, which is the, the NAV that was announced in February, that was, as I say, trending upwards, which is good news. And it was really being driven by the revision of the power price assumptions. Um, but this time round, we've, we've got a much, much bigger increase, uh, say 13 to 15%. And they say it's, this is a combination of further um, high, effect of higher short-term power prices and also inflation expectations. So there's, there's some, underneath that, there's them also some bits where they've, they've been buying things and they're revaluing them um, post-acquisition. But well, I don't think that's going to be particularly material. We're going to have to wait and find out. Now, the, the key to this, I think, is that JLEN is, I think, the uh, renewable energy fund with the highest uh, degree of inflation-linked revenues. So 71% of its current revenue is inflation-linked. And um, you can pair that with something like Bluefield Solar, that's about 62, or Green Coat UK Wind is much lower, about sort of 40%. And that's really, for JLEN's case, driven by the mix of things that it's investing in. And one of the things that it's got there is, is almost a quarter of the fund in anaerobic digestion. And that with a renewable heat incentive comes with quite chunky subsidies. And so that is why there's a higher proportion of revenue of um, RPI link revenues than some of the other funds. So the assumptions that Jalen was using in its NAV back at the end of December was that the inflation rate in the UK would average at about 3% a year from now until 2030, and then beyond that would fall to two and a quarter percent. But as we know, um, inflation is measured by RPI and CPI has been soaring. RPI is much higher than CPI is, um, and RPI is still what's driving the subsidies, and that doesn't change yet. <clears throat> so we've got now, um, at the end of March, RPI was 9%. And um, when we get the April number, I think they could be higher again. So this is really what's been driving the NAV move, I think. Um, just thinking about the, the power price arrangements, <coughs> it says that it's been trying to lock those in. So it's been trying to lock in um, high power prices, so it's got some predictability in its income. Um, if anything, it was a bit too early in that. So it's missed out on some of those big price hikes uh, that we've seen. Um, the solar portfolio is, is locked through until March 23. Um, some of the pre-sales that they've made of energy from the wind portfolio are starting to roll off now. Um, and you can see how that, that drops. So from 100% in March, <coughs> down to 87 in September, and then gradually falling away. Um, over time. None of these um, arrangements are particularly long term. So it's not like the, the US market where you lock in power press agreements for 15, 20, 25 years. These tend to be, as it says here, six months to three years. So they, they do roll over. 
So this is the net effect. Uh, this is from um, JLEN's end of September numbers. So things will have moved slightly since then, but, but not much. And you can see that these are the, the, the assumptions that it's using in its discounted cash flow um, to, to work out what the NAV is. So the, the, NAV, the, the power price here for, um, falls away um, until whatever that is, probably about 2024, then much shallower decline, and then goes down the way um, till we, we're getting some numbers close to sort of 40 pounds a megawatt. So sort of beyond 2050, that sort of time, time frame. Um, and then this is what the power price is actually doing at the moment. So this is just over the past year. So we say with 40 pounds a megawatt, what we've got is the current spot price is around 254 pounds a megawatt. So massively, massively higher than that. Um, and that's, it's being sustained. It, it's, it seems to be still climbing, um, the, the, the pattern we've got here. Um, and we know that with Russia turning off gas pipes um, running to Europe, that's driving up gas prices and gas prices are the main thing that drive UK power prices. So those power prices may still be going up now, and the problem may persist for, for longer than, than we'd like, we'd like it to. Um, but this is the sort of interesting chart, I think. So this is the mix of JLEN's forecast revenue in its NAV, again, end of the end of um, September 2021. So things will have moved up slightly since then. Um, but it just shows you, so at the moment, Subsidies are about 71% of the revenue. Um, but actually, over the whole piece, so in the, within the NAV, subsidies account for about 60% of, of all of its NAV. Um, merchant power, about 23%, because obviously the long term contracts, as they say, aren't that long term, they, they roll off. And so, so that sort of gets re renewed over time. And then because it's diversified and it's got other sorts of revenue streams outside of the renewable energy stuff. That we normally talk about, there, there's an element of that too. So the effects of hiking up merchant power prices is a short-term one. We could see a spike sort of like this and going back down again. Uh, it might persist for a few more years, but that the size of that light green band in there won't increase significantly um, to affect the NAV to push that much, much higher. But a 10% there or thereabouts hike in the subsidy revenue makes a massive difference to, to the size of that, the area of the curve here, and rolls way out into the future. So inflation has a much bigger impact on the NAV than uh, short-term power price hike does. Um, and because I think they weren't really adjusting for the higher inflation back in September, and they are now, this is what's driving the, the NAV price hike, that's what I think is going on. So we'll, we'll know what the inflation rate was at the end of April, at end of April in um, 18th of May, so next week. We'll probably also know uh, what JLEN has actually sort of uh, levers has JLEN moved to, to move the NAV and what their new NAV is next week. Um, so we'll, we'll look out for that. And what we'll do is we'll write a story on the, on the website about what's been driving it and try and explain that for you. But I think the key thing to remember here is the power price effect, while it's obviously very good news, maybe temporary, but the inflation effect is permanent. Right. Then we've got some fundraisers going on across the sector. Um, I mean, there's lots of fundraisers all the time, but I just thought we'd have a look at these two. So the first of those is Ecofin US Renewables. And there is a big difference between the US renewables funds and the UK ones. Um, in terms of the amount of money it's looking for, it's not really very ambitious. And we're really only talking about $25 million. Um, it has deployed all of its IPO proceeds now. Um, it did that well ahead of the, the deadline. Um, it's also racked up 9 million of debt on its credit facility, um, which, is, which is good. So, so basically it means that once it takes in fresh equity, um, that some of that just goes to pay, pay back the debt. And so what you don't get is a huge cash drag from um, growing the fund. And, and that carries on for the foreseeable future. Um, they've got a near-term pipeline of $51 million, 
So I think they should be able to deploy this money quite quickly. Um, and in terms of what they're doing, in terms of the issue price, um, you're going to be able to get shares of uh, just over a dollar, one, one dollar and one cent and a half. Um, that compares to a price of about 107 before and an AV of about 97 and a half cents more or less. So, so it's a reasonable um, kind of price, sort of set in the middle of those two. Um, if it gets the money at once, um, it's looking that $51 million breaks down into funding um, an ongoing um, portfolio of, uh, that it's been listed in already of solar assets across the states. And these are coming with 25 year power purchase agreements to so say that that is what makes a difference here. Uh, and then also there's, there's 11 million dollars in one chunk for um, a new solar farm in Maine. But there's a much, much bigger pipeline beyond that. Um, and the manager is obviously looking at a huge number of deals to, to get down to just to do what he's doing. So really this one could be an awful lot bigger. And I'm kind of surprised they're not being more ambitious in terms of the amount of money they're trying to raise, but I think it probably comes down to the cost of doing that and not wanting to issue a very expensive prospectus. So we could see more fundraisers down the line. I think that's, that's, that's almost guaranteed. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Right, so Bluefield Solar is the other one. So um, it's doing a placing offer subscription at 130p a share. And again, that's, a, that's sort of set in between the DNAV and where the share price has been trading. Um, and it's still a, a discount to, to the current share price today. Uh, what we don't know is how much money they're actually looking for, but I think we're probably talking about something much more substantial than $25 million that EcoFin is looking for, um, because it's got some fairly chunky ambitions. Um, it's just increased the size of its revolving credit credit facility um so that's now 200 million and that's fully drawn down at the moment and at that sort of level it's it's massively massively geared so the, there's a sort of cap of 50 percent um gearing in the fund on a, on a loan to value basis which works out in conventional gearing about 100 percent, and we're up to sort of 95.3 now so so getting that reduced fairly quickly is it would be you know i think set a lot of people's minds at rest probably but beyond that, they've got quite a lot of money that they want to spend. So again, it's the same thing we talked about before with, with Ecofen. Spend the money using the volume credit facility, raise some money uh, in the equity market and pay that down. And that, that revolves the problem of, of um, cash drag. Um, so some quite chunky, as I say, development opportunities that they've still got um, and a much, much bigger pipeline than they're looking to, to fund now. Um, but having sort of been fairly sort of steady state for a long time, this fund now is expanding and expanding relatively quickly. Um, and also it's obviously it's going into wind as well as solar now, um, which is one of the things that uh, the manager was quite keen to do. So this um, is all predicated on the back of a recent acquisition that it's made. Uh, the manager says, there aren't that many portfolios of um, established solar and wind available to buy at the moment. Um, and this was a portfolio that's been touted around. Um, so that it was a competitive bid that they, they had to engage in to, to acquire it. Um, but 93 uh, megawatt of solar and wind, um, and you can see the split of solar and wind in here. Um, we've come in with a sort of 57% of um, subsidy income. Um, and that reflects the, the asset mix because the, the subsidies on wind and solar aren't quite the same. Um, and some of that is being pre-sold, um, the, the output from that, £180 a megawatt, which is obviously still below that 254 we were looking at a second ago in terms of what spot prices have been way, way higher than um, some of the PPAs that have been agreed on other funds. So um, all good stuff, all going in the right direction, plenty more to do. And um, this just shows you how that the fund has been evolving since um, they, they changed the mandate. So um, it was all under all solar and it hadn't been happened for a long time beforehand. Now we're sort of 83 percent solar and the fund is getting a lot bigger and, and obviously it's going to be bigger again. So I'm going to now hand over to Richard, who's going to talk you through what's going on in the property world. 
That's one great. Thanks, James. Yeah, so a um, couple of big um, announcements this week or over the weekend. Um, we heard that Shaftesbury and Capital Counties were um, discussing a possible merger, um, all share merger combined capital mar uh, market cap of 3.5 billion. Um, and then earlier this week, LXOA REIT and Secure Income REIT also um, announced that they um, in discussions and actually recommending a, um, a merger of the two uh, long income funds, um, which would see each um, secure income share get 3.32 new LXI shares that would have a combined market cap of about six, uh, 2.6 billion. So, so creating two massive um, new companies basically, which is it, quite exciting that both, both got um, uh, real merits of, of, of doing this. So firstly, Shaftesbury and Capital Counties. Um, if you don't know, these own massive parts of the West End. Um, so Capital Counties owns pretty much the whole of Covent Garden and um, and buildings around there. And Shaftesbury own a bit of Covent Garden, um, Carnaby Street, Chinatown, Soho. Um, and together, massive portfolio. So about, worth about 5 billion together, 2.9 million square foot. Um, now, the interesting point of the merger would be that the, um, the composition of the management team. So Shaftesbury's um, management team, so Brian Bickle, who, who's the CEO, and, uh, and a couple of other their, of their senior directors would leave um, if, if the merger were to happen, um, leaving Ian Hawks, Hawksworth, who's the chief executive of Capital Counties at the moment, in charge. And, um, and a couple of other senior positions there that you've got there, um, which may um, concern current Shaftesbury shareholders. Brian Bickle's very well respected. What they do, um, what they've done um, in sort of curating, especially sort of around Carnaby Street, has been has been re really good. So there may be some concern there that they're, they're losing. Um, quite a senior guy there, but it, it does make sense, and it's been on the cards for a while. Uh, Capital and Counties bought twenty five percent of Shaftesbury back in twenty twenty, um, and it's been it's been mooted for, for for years before that as well. The the, the synergies of the portfolio, it, it all works. So we go on to the next slide. We we'll, we'll see a bit more um, of what's happened, especially since COVID. So. Both of their portfolio, as, as you can imagine, have been um, pretty hard hit during the COVID. Obviously, lockdowns, um, lack of international travel. Obviously, central London, especially the West End, is quite dependent on um, tourism and, and um, especially international tourists. And that's not expected to recover for to, to pre-COVID levels for a number of years yet. So um, merging together, having a bigger outfit um more sort of cost savings together and things like that does does make sense at the moment valuations are starting to pick up um as you can see here the sh share price there's no navs on these um these charts but you can see the share prices just dropped early 2020 and haven't recovered for either fund um and and that's that was replicated in that in their in their navs as well. So at the moment, nav for Shaftesbury is uh, 619, which is puts it on a, uh, on a bit of a discount. Um, that's um, down 15% in, in the year to September. And si since the start of um, COVID, I mean, that was up at sort of 982 in September 19. So you can just see the, the, the impact it's had there. Capital counties, Similar back in December 19, just before the COVID, it, its nav was at 293. It's now at 214. But we, we have seen in the last sort of six months or so real recovery in, in valuations as things have opened up. Um, but we, we're not back where we were before COVID and, and probably won't be for, for a couple of years. But um, yeah, merging together, um, pretty, pretty good news, I think, for, for shareholders. Um, but we'll see what happens on that one. That that's that, there's no guarantee that that's going to going to come off. Um, this one is further down the line. So LXI and uh, Secure Income, again, massive synergies within the portfolios. Both um, 
lot uh, focused on long term incomes. So they they have um, some of the the longest um, income portfolios in in the REIT sector. Uh, combined, they'd have a three point nine billion portfolio, three hundred forty six properties, all fully let. Um, and as you can see, there twenty six years on the wall, which is the unexpired lease terms, um, which is long, and um, and they're all or sort of 98% are index linked. So you've got some protection there on, on um, inflation. Um, LXI is more on food stores, hotels, healthcare, things like that. Um, secure income has leisure, which is sort of Merlin theme, theme parks, healthcare and hotels. So putting them together would, um, would sort of further diversify the, the portfolios as well across um, sectors. Now the um, LXI um, re advisors will advise the new co the combined company, and they will buy um, secure incomes investment advisors. Press Press is part of this deal. Uh, Nick Leslaw, who's the CEO, and Sally Gum, who's the CFO of um, Press or or Secure Income, will join the the new company's um, board as non executive directors which a bit of continuity there. And, and Nick Leslaw especially is, is, is um, a, a big big name in property. So it would have been um, detrimental to, to lose his experience in this. So it's good to see that he's staying on on the board. Um, on to the next slide, James. So as I said, complementary portfolios, further diversified. Um, the cost savings that, that they reckon it's 8.6 million a year in cost savings. The management fee is going to come down, but also obviously that's only going to be one management fee. Operational costs as well. And they said that will all come to 8.6 million, which is which is a lot of savings. Um, those synergies expected um, to mean that it will have one of the lowest um, expense ratios in the in the REIT sector. Um, and they say potential for enhanced dividends and in increase in returns. Um, and Secure income, which is currently on AIM, will obviously come across into um, LXI onto the main market. So um, there'll be increased liquidity in the shares as well, which is all good news. Uh, um, just on the last slide here, just see how LXI have been going um, last well, since it launched uh, five years ago. So um, obviously dropped off, start of COVID, came back a bit, but then both companies had trouble with one of their landlords, um, which was um, Travel Lodge, who um, didn't basically didn't want, want to pay rent. So they both had a bit of a bit of a hit there and had to renegotiate terms and things like that. But that they've overcome that. And as you can see, just their share price has taken off as, they, as, as they've grown. They've, they've done a couple of big um, fundraisers, bought big portfolios in um, in the supermarket sector and, and things like that, and and, and then NAV has, has, has really recovered strongly because of that. And um, trading around, well, they've just fallen into a discount, but had had been um, trading at a, a decent premium um, to, to that NAV. So it'd be interesting to see. They they reckon sort of July time this will this will all come through, and uh, as you can see, the shareholders. Share price has come off a bit on LXI since it was announced, but um, but for me it's a, it's it's a good it will be a good outcome to put these together with the cost synergies and and the potential to to grow from there. So um, exciting times, and we'll I'll, I'll keep an eye on this and uh, and see see where it goes from there. Oh, cool. thanks, Richard. Uh, there's a question here. Do you think there's any kind of um, competition authority reason to to look at the Capital and Counties deal? Because um, so you basically will only have one landlord for the West End. Well, no, not really. I, it's not for the whole of the West End. We're talking Covent Garden, so parts of Soho, and uh, and Carnaby, and and sort of Chinatown. Um, I don't, I don't think they'll be. They they may look into it. I can't see it um, not going ahead. Um, and then what, what what's this question on? It's really just trying to say, is there a sort of a net benefit to, to one set of shareholders, whether you're an NXI shareholder or a security can reach shareholder from doing the deal? 
or, or, or is it sort of ego driven in terms of just making the thing bigger? Well, there, there is um, there is benefits for both, isn't it, with, with the costs um, and, and things like that. Um, but there, there were talks that this was happening end of last year, so sort of September time last year, and, and then LXI came out and said, no, this this we did have to, initial talks, but this isn't progressing. And obviously, they've revisited it. I'm not. I'm not sure it's a, It's an ego thing. I, I. I think it makes perfect sense to um to put them together. The the both long income focused, and I'm sure they they'll do a lot better as one bigger company than than two smaller companies. To be honest. Okay. Cool. Great. Thanks very much for that. Um. Now we need to.